Ja sam Jelena Jovanović, predsjednica sa Kravane, ovdje imamo inače predstavnika organizacije i organizacije Beokona, to je društvo Hanova naučna tasta Lazar Komačić, ovo je Boja Butković, koji je inače i organizator i vođa book club-a u okviru Lazara Komačića, koji, ako ne znate, postoji, jedno mesečno pričamo o knjiga koje nam Bojan zada i koji je jako dobro upoznat sa zadovanjem scenom. Tako da ćemo mi biti sagovornici gospodine Eriksson i pričat ćemo o modernu fantaziju, pa zašto ne je o ISF-u, trendovima, šta se dešava na sceni i sve u ostalo čega se dotaknemo. A ja ću se preći na engleski, s obzirom da će cijel panel biti vođen na engleskom, nadam zbog naše posta. Kad budemo otvorili prostor za pitanja, neko slučajno ima problem sa engleskim slovom, postate pitanje na srpskom i ja ću ga prevesti. So, after the introductions were made, there's one introduction left, and that's Mr. Erickson, our guest of honor. We are really, really honored to have him here. Very happy to be here. So, uh, I explained already to the audience that we'll be talking uh, about contemporary fantasy and sci-fi, because I know you read more sci-fi, actually, right now. So, I think that uh, we already discussed some topics, and I think that the topic that kind of imposes itself uh, when we talk about fantasy today is Grimdark, and the popularity of Grimdark. So, could you tell us something about that, your opinion about that? Um. I suppose if, if you were sitting here uh, yesterday, you probably have heard this already, but I don't really feel that Grimdark is um, either a new phenomenon in fantasy, uh, nor do I think it will be very long-lived. I think it's, uh, it's, it's going to have a fairly short um, time span of, of popularity, primarily because it is innately nihilistic, and so there is no... Um, there's no stepping out through to the other side. Uh, it is all aspiring downwards. And because of that, um, one is left with the potential anyways of, um, I guess, feeling despair. And despair is not a good feeling. Um, and so I think fantasy is going to start rebounding and um, hopefully um, invoke a kind of uh, optimism or at least um, faith in, in a better future. And if we can do that as, as fantasy authors, then um, maybe we can offer that uh, to the world at large. And uh, also, while well, we were discussing the dark, we were talking about how actually violence was a characteristic of fantasy from the very beginning. So why do you think that the focus on it right now is so strong? Why is it now so prominent the focus on, on like the grimdark and violence? Um, I think a lot of violence, uh, you know, you watch it on film, you watch it on television, um, and you read it in the books. It's, it's kind of a, it's hard to describe, but it's, it's a response. And it's a response generally to a, a sense or a feeling of helplessness. Um, so one can lash out, at least in their imagination, or on the, on the computer screen. Um, and uh, I guess try to push their way free of all the impediments that, that exist in their lives. And so it, it becomes a kind of wish fulfillment um, aspect to, to uh, I mean, fantasy and film, uh, superhero films, all of these things, they're, they're all, they all have a certain aspect of wish fulfillment. And um, of course, what happens with that is, is uh, creators of these works of art find themselves being pushed towards more and more um, graphic and explicit uh, dis descriptions of violence um, until it, it begins to think you know, uh, the audience. Um, one of the things I've noticed, um, especially in film, because I think I think fantasy is, as a genre, um, is, is kind of lagging behind uh, a lot of what's happening in the contemporary film and television. Uh, especially with the, the notion of, of superheroes and, and heroes. Um, how many times in the last well, five years have you seen uh, a blockbuster Hollywood film 
and where you have some scene where a tall building uh, is blasted into ruin and, and collapses in the city. Um, it, I, I can't figure out what Hollywood was up to with this because basically it is taking the, the iconography of 9-11 and repeating it ad nauseum um, in one film after another. Even the second Star Trek film had it, uh, where all of San Francisco is basically destroyed. Um, and of course Superman versus uh, Batman and uh, the Avengers and all the rest. Um, and it's as if it's become ritualistic to see this. And um, I'm, I'm quite curious to see what the effect of that would be over the, in the next few um, well, years, or if not decades. Um, we are doing something very strange with, with our own history. And uh, through film, uh, we can sort of see that being played out. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, we're talking about wind art and violence and uh, topics that we discussed in those works. I know that yesterday you mentioned compassion as one of the important uh, things in your books. And it seems that in this trend in epic fantasy right now, that is not such a desirable trait. That is not something that is actually valued by the characters or the universes that are created by the authors. So, do you and have that, a comment on that? Yeah, well, that's, that's a sad comment, isn't it? Um, I think I think you've all seen uh, the classic image of the, the hero, either on, on film or television, um, walking out of a, an exploding building, or a building on fire, or a car blows up behind them, and they've got the super cool look, and um, they're expressionless, and uh, it's sort of the James Bond approach, especially the latest James Bond, um, where the hero is, in a sense, unaffected by the chaos and, and, and the destruction that seems to accompany them everywhere. Um, having said that, some of the new uh, Marvel um, uh, television series are actually starting to address that uh, a bit more directly. But for a long time, um, it was as if the heroes um, that we are to um, admire and emulate and dress up like um, were effectively as sociopathic as the enemies, as the bad guys, and as the evil people. Um, and I, I, I always felt sorry for a lot of the actors because they're basically told to put on that cool expression and never change it for an entire film. So there, there, there's no opportunity to actually act. They're simply uh, a kind of a robotic um, uh, figure that is marched through uh, by the director, a uh, whole series of, of actions. And, and all the rest. And so we really have this twisted notion of what heroism is. And um, it will be interesting to see how that, how that plays out. And it's just interesting that you mentioned sociopathic heroes, because I think there is also a trend in fantasy where you have not even anti-heroes, but really guys who would be villains in other books that you are supposed to follow and root for and that somehow, somehow empathize with. And if, do you think that maybe that is also influenced, for example, by RPGs? Because we discussed role-playing games and how everybody sooner or later starts playing the neutral hero characters because that's fun. So you think that, 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 do you think that has something to do with it? It's well, supposed I, to be I know, fun I know, evil? Yeah, <laughs> I know somebody asked, um, has asked me regarding switching from AD&D to GURPS uh, for the... Okay, we role-played... Um, the entire Malazan world and built the history through role playing. And um, so the question is why did we switch from AD and D to GURPS? And one of the reasons was uh, we were resisting the uh, alignment issues in D and D. Um, and so we would generally, even within that, that format, we would play chaotic neutral uh, at, at best. Um, simply because it, it, it left the characters more freewheeling what they could do. And GURPS is a very freewheeling style of, of game. And um, that's probably why we sort of left the, the D and D stuff. Um, yeah, it's uh, I uh, how many of you are familiar with my novellas, uh Bokalin and Corporal Brooch? Yeah? Well um, basically they are set in the same world as, as the Malaysian world. Um, the two main characters, one is a, a necromancer and the other one is, um, well, a conjurer of demons. 
Um, well, actually, yeah, that's how it works. Okay. Um, and the point of view is from um, their beleaguered manservant, um, who thought taking a, a job as, as their manservant was a better option uh, than staying home with his wife. Um, but I wrote those uh, as, as satires. Um, and so I made the two characters um, just reprehensibly evil. And, um, and then made fun of that. Um, so, I guess I was, I was thinking in terms of the banality of evil. And, and through Bocalane and Corporal Broach, uh, I got to play around with that. Um, but at the same time, uh, I, think, I think by making fun of evil, uh, you take a lot of its power away. And uh, that's something I was, I was setting out to do with, with, with these books. Um, but in terms of, yeah, in terms of sort of your sociopathic heroes, um, there's, really, there's really nowhere to go with them, right? Because there, there's no character development. There's only a succession of, of experiences uh, for which they seem to have no emotional um, legacy. And so even, for example, the, the second Star Trek film and the reboot. Um, so through the actions of Spock, the entire enterprise is sent down into the atmosphere and crashes through uh, most of San, San Francisco. Um, presumably killing tens of thousands of people. But by the end of the film, not, you know, ten minutes later, um, you know, they're smiling on their new ship and, and taking off. And you're just thinking, I mean, first of all, the original series of Star Trek um, would never consider that. Uh, there has to be a consequence to, to the actions. Um, and when you have heroes for whom there is really no consequence, uh, I really don't know where that goes in terms of dr drama or in terms of um, inviting the audience to, to experience emotions. Um, my Malazza series, I, I've often described it as it's not fantasy with tragic elements, it is tragedy with fantastic elements. And I was very interested in, in uh, resurrecting uh, tragedy as, as a cathartic form of literature, um, simply because I want my audience to feel. And, and in order for them to feel, I have to, I have to feel first. Um, and just while we were talking, you were talking and we were talking about sociopathic characters and anti-heroes and so on. And I was thinking that those sociopathic heroes are also kind of a wish fulfillment fantasy and power trip, so to say. And it seems to me that in the current film, my opinion, that in current epic fantasy, there are a lot of those power trips. Mm -hmm. A lot of characters and heroes who just become better and better, or more evil and more evil. Yep. So do, do you think that, I mean, now it sounds stupid, do you think that's a trend, <laughs> yes or no, but uh, do you have a feeling that that's a thing right now? I mean, of course, epic fantasy always had that visual fulfillment element. Yeah, um, yeah I, th I think uh, fantasy literature is in conversation with reality, and so it, it's, it's a kind of a twisted reflection of what's going on in the world today. Um, but it's not, it's, not, it, it's not isolated, so it's picking up influence from film and television, um, and it's picking up influences from, from the news. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if, if you have a sense, culturally, uh, and in terms of your civilization, that the authority figures, uh, the figures in power uh, in our world, um, are basically able to get away with murder. Um, then that really undermines that sense of authority. And at which point, it, it's almost logical and rational to say, well, anything goes if you can get away with it. And so that element of wish fulfillment is, is very much there for uh, a lot of the heroes in, in, in uh, fantasy literature. That being said, I think it's going to change. I think it's probably already changing. I just want to confirm that because... Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Uh, I just wanted to confirm that because you can see in a few ways uh, there is a the award comes. The Catherine Edison with the Goblin Emperor. The, um, yeah. Catherine Edison with the um, Goblin Emperor, now Minovic with the Protect. Uh, those are fantasies that seem like a rebound and answer to the to the grim dark. They are almost completely opposite uh, to to the grim. So I think that is happening right now. But what is interesting is if 
fantasy is escapism, which is uh, something of uh, fantasy is often accused, like it's a bad thing. If we are escaping into a nihilistic world, what kind of escapism is that? So what is the role that fantasy uh, can offer to, to fans and readers in, uh, in that sense? Um, I, I, I never considered uh, at least the fantasy I was writing as being escapist in any sense. Um, I very much tied it to uh, the real world in terms of its themes. And, um, and a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, the main sort of issues or topics uh, that I discuss through the fiction uh, are, are relevant to the times in which the novels were written. So I don't really see escapism. And I was certainly interested in uh, the ambivalence uh, and ambiguity of, of gray-shaded characters rather than characters who are, uh, uh, I guess, in terms of the tropes, uh, cliched you know, as, as all evil or as all good. And uh, we mentioned this escape escapism. And the thing is that right now, in the acid and fantasy fandom and the audience, there are like these uh, huge clashes. Because, I mean, we all see what happened with the Hugos. And there's this uh, feeling of a group of fans that fantasy is here and acid is here to make us feel good. And we shouldn't introduce any topics from the real world into it that makes us make us feel bad. And the thing is you mentioned that fantasy is sort of a dialogue with the reality. So how do you see that situation? There are new trends where different people kind of try to get in and disrupt the status quo, so to say. In the usual for example in the case of every fantasy Eurocentrism. And on the other hand you have this backlash and a reaction from group of fans were like leave us alone and this is Literature, this is fantasy, it's not real life. Um, yeah, broadly speaking, there, there, in terms of a, a writer's point of view, there are, there are two approaches to, to fiction. Um, one is embodied by uh, a writer named John Gardner in the United States who died uh, maybe 30 years ago now, who wrote about something called moral fiction. And his, his central argument was that fiction has a moral context. And so, as an author, as a writer, you need to take responsibility for your characters and their actions. Um, which is not to say that all the characters have to be, um, I don't know, ethically or morally upright. But you have to recognize that um, you are presenting a, a, a kind of um, a kind of vision of the world. Um, and through the choices you make in terms of the story you're telling, uh, it, it can have a, a a very real effect on a very real audience. Now, in, in contrast to him, uh, to John Gardner's ideas of moral fiction, we had another American writer named William Gass who said, well, that's absolutely not true. Um, fiction is fiction. So the rape that occurred on page 27 never happened. Uh, the slaughter of uh, people on page 240 never happened. And therefore, there is no moral context in fiction. It is simply entertainment. It's simply there for you to take what you want from it. Um, I fall on the side of John Gardner. I, I, I think as soon as, you would, as soon as you write something with the intent of engaging another person, a human being, you have entered into a moral context. There is no escaping it. Um, but at the same time, um, it is not necessarily stopping you from doing or writing whatever it is you want to write. And all I, all I try to argue for is, is to say to authors and writers, be prepared to defend yourself for the choices you've made in your work. Because especially now, um, writers, uh, especially in genre, are far more present um, in front of audiences, in front of their readership uh, through online presence. Um, through their own sites, uh, websites, and, and blogs, and uh, commentaries, and all the rest. And so, um, the, the, the chances of being called out on um, the choices you make in your fiction are, are now much higher than they used to be. Uh, there was a time when writers could just, whatever they wrote, um, take it or leave it, and they would stay 
very private and uh, very hidden from, from the public eye. Um, publishers don't want us to do that anymore. Um, they want us out there doing the PR for them. So um, because of that, we are even more at risk in terms of the comments we make um, are open to challenge. And, and, and my position is absolutely challenge them. Uh, challenge all of us in our decisions that, that we as writer, writers make. Um, and let's engage in that, in that dialogue. Because, uh, yeah, a lot of, especially in secondary world building, a lot of um, assumptions can be carried across from our world into uh, the fictional world. So, in as much as people may say, um, it's just fiction, just entertainment, if every single secondary fantasy world you, you create as a writer is a patriarchy, you're actually Im implying that there's a kind of natural law that says all human societies have to sort of shake down to a patriarchal uh, structure, which of course is nonsense. But um, if you've not thought about it and you're, you're carrying that assumption across into, into your fantasy world, uh, you are a fair game to be challenged on. So we just agree on everything. So uh, maybe I'll read. Uh, maybe I'll have one as a question now. No, I, I, I wanted to go some, to something. To something different. completely. Okay, then yes. maybe I can work on this a bit more. Um, it's interesting to know that, especially now in science fiction, there are a lot, like I said, a lot of trends moving forward and novels and novelas and stories challenge all the assumptions regarding gender and mm -hmm. regarding. We've talked about Anne Mike yep. and the ancillary trilogy, for example. And it seems to me that in fantasy, things are lagging a bit behind. Do you think that fantasy usually lags behind science fiction? Or is it just a thing that people still think of fantasy, epic fantasy, something that's set in a European pseudo feudal, pseudo medieval society? Well, I, I think there's a bit of both. But I think it is starting to. Um, <laughs> expand but you have to realize also that a lot of um, a lot of fantasy is geared towards the the largest uh, block of uh, potential uh, audience um, that's out there which is the United States and so um, it, it almost um, uh, I guess implicitly has a, a kind of um, dominant Eurocentric uh, sensibility to it, and so um, you know, American and Canadians, uh, people in the New World, at least in the North part, um, when they try to think of a medieval setting, uh, they think England, right? and um, and of course that is uh, a very uh, pale-skinned uh, island. So, especially in the medieval times, uh, and so there is a kind of a cultural bias that, that's always there, um, and I think. One of the things that, that is now being challenged is, is that kind of uh, Eurocentrism. And uh, we're seeing more of it. We're seeing some really cool stuff. Uh, N.K. Jemsen, uh, Nala Nail Nail Hopkins, and, um, a lot of uh, very interesting uh, fantasy writers are starting to, to uh, uh, I, guess, I guess, strip away that, that Eurocentric, uh, white-centered uh, storytelling. And I think it, it, it's, it's long overdue. Okay, th this is a bit connected with uh, the next question, uh, uh, which is how much the academia is important to fantasy? How much is it uh, is actually important to legitimize fantasy as a genre, as a literature? Because for science fiction was for a very long time like someone wanted child something that is for kids, and it was from the 70s. And 60s, it is legitimized now. And there are all courses on universities on science fiction, but still nothing in fantasy. So, is it important at all for fantasy to to be acknowledged by academia, or we, we can go by without it? Um, no, I, I think it is. Um, but a lot of it is just uh, the basic mechanics of, of what is um, what is possible for academics, especially in universities, uh, a series is uh, a major undertaking for them. And um, whereas uh, standalone novels and novellas and short stories um, are far more easily uh, managed, consumed and packaged and then talked about. So we get a lot of um, 
subgenres of fantasy uh, will show up in, in uh, academic discourse. Uh, so urban fantasy, um, young YA, um, or YA fantasies. Um, so all those sort of subdivisions um, are much more manageable. Um, but uh, the epic series, um, those, are, those are huge beasts to handle. And um, so I think a lot, of, a lot of academia sort of steers away from it. Um, only, the, only the formative works that, that those academics read when they were, you know, um, teenagers will stay with them and they may study those things. So uh, there, there is a generational lag, but um, it's a hard one to talk about because I mean, you can describe epic fantasy as uh, beginning with uh, Gilgamesh, beginning with the Iliad and the Odyssey. Um, and that strain has not sort of altered over time. Um, uh, its, it's relevance to, to culture and society has probably altered and diminished to a large extent. Uh, yes, but uh, we talked about it earlier. Uh, we talked about it earlier. Um, during the, the, the second half of the 20th century, uh, the science fiction the science fiction was at the forefront of human thought, and now it's legitimized. And every decade, almost uh, almost every decade, uh, brought something completely new to science fiction. In the 60s, new wave. In the 80s, cyberpunk. 90s, um, there was always something different uh, that would go um, in collusion with the thinking uh, of the, the state of the world. Uh, now I see that from the new space opera, which was in the 90s. There is almost nothing uh, new in that sense in science fiction, but fantasy is now producing new trends, uh, new answers to um, to situation around us. So maybe is it fantasy supplementing um, the uh, supplementing uh, supplanting sorry supplanting science fiction uh, in our minds or in our culture, or maybe just it's more popular. It's always more popular. What do you think about that? It has always been more popular, but um, I think what's the other thing that's happening, of course, is um, the crisis of imagination that, that is afflicting Hollywood. Um, so science fiction these days are these films tend to be, with a few exceptions, um, retreads and, and remakes. Um, so the the old ideas are simply being run through again with new special effects, and that seems to be the only justification for remaking a film is that we can do better CGI now than we could before. Uh, the stories uh, are simply repeated. Um, so, and, and, and the turnaround time is even short enough for, for, uh, for science fiction. Um, if you think in terms of, um, well, what was the one set on Mars originally with um, Schwarzenegger? Total Recall. Total Recall. I mean, uh, what was it? Ten years between the films? Something along that line. Fifteen years. Twenty. I think. Yeah. 20. Well, right. Well, there you go. Um, it's it's not very long compared to what has been going on. And so, Hollywood and, and the best writers of Hollywood have left film anyway. So they've gone into television, and that's why television has gotten as good as it has. Um, and so there is that crisis, and we're, we're not seeing original science fiction showing up. Um, Interstellar, yes, uh, is probably uh, one of the better examples of uh, fairly new science fiction. Um, and fantasy was the last genre to be explored in film and television. And it took, it took Game of Thrones to um, kick the door open. Um, and so, as, as a genre, we're, we're very young um, in terms of film and television. And so, it, and I think it is evolving very quickly and it's legitimizing itself. At a very rapid pace, and yeah, um, it may well supplant a lot of science fiction. And uh, my gathered, uh, gathered from your earlier answers that you definitely think that uh, television and movies are the things that most influence modern fantasy. Uh, but during the 80s, it was role playing. Yes. Uh, maybe video games now. So uh, what do you? What uh, do you I think, think I think video games is sort of the transition between the role playing, the tabletop role playing stuff, and then film stuff, um, in terms of its effect on fantasy, but it, it is a huge effect. Um, in many ways, uh, it, it's taken the place of, of the Tolkien, um, uh, I guess, origins of, of modern fantasy. Um, I think uh, role-playing games 
will be recognized down the road as, as a crucial element in what has happened to Edmonton. But uh, do you think, uh, uh, as, is, as you said before, there is a kind of stigma for the early role-playing uh, influenced fantasy, uh, 80s fantasy from the Terry Brooks, which is not, it's talking gone, but um, Feist, Teddings and similar problem, even similar writers. But the, uh, do you think that role-playing influenced fantasy is now more, there is more quality in it, so it doesn't have that bad reputation it used to have? Um, possibly, but let's face it, the, the, the people playing the role-playing games, uh, uh, they're older, they're 20 years older, and so their level of sophistication, what they want out of the role-playing games has also evolved, and so they are more sophisticated in, in the gaming that they do, and um, that's, just, that's just how it goes. So I think, I think even the, the works that are role-played, or were role-played, and are now um, fantasy novels, are going to be more sophisticated uh, and moving moving away from the tropes that, that were well established in the 70s and 80s. Okay. Yana? <laughs> Yana? <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, since we discussed RPG, we always go back to RPGs. I mean, we all role play, so it's something that <laughs> I think we come back to. And uh, it, what RPGs bring to my mind is world building. Because you said that you Malzahn actually has its roots in the RPG sessions that you did with another person, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, when when you look at world building in current fantasy, uh, do you think it plays a very important role? Because for a while in fantasy, the world building was there to kind of help the character to evolve, mm -hmm. and you know, magic was there because he needed to have magic to be able to do something. And for example, in your books, you have a very uh, strong feeling of a world, that there is very firm foundations mm -hmm. that it's happening. I mean, the world is the main, the world, sorry, yeah. The world almost seems the main character, to me at least, that's my feeling. So do you think that the world being building is important for the current uh, epic fantasy or even science fiction writers? Yeah. Um... And again, it, it comes back to, to uh, what you want to um, change or take from this world into, into that world building, uh, into that secondary world. Um, and what are the rules that uh, govern that world? And how are they different from our rules uh, of physics and, and, um, and culture for that matter? Um, and then through that contrast between that secondary world you've created and the world of your audience, which is out here, in the real world, you can then comment on the real world. And so it becomes a vehicle. Um, fantasy is the only genre that you can take a metaphor and make it real. Mm -hmm. And um, once you sort of realize that as a writer, it's very liberating. I mean, of course, it's easy to see where you fall on that. It's just, right, it's just literature, it doesn't matter, or yes, it matters argument. Well, you know what, I'll tell you right now, I'm writing a, a memetic you know what Mimetic is? A, a real world novel. Okay, so it's set in the real world. Um, it's a science fiction novel. And it suddenly struck me, I was about, I don't know, uh, 300 pages in, that it is so much easier to write. And I came out of um, the creative writing programs at the University of Victoria, an undergraduate program, and then the Iowa Writers' Workshop, which was a very prestigious American uh, writing workshop for my master's degree. Uh, in both cases, I was writing contemporary romantic fiction, um, quote, literary fiction. And I can sit now, all these years later, and say that that stuff was easy compared to fantasy. Um, and the, the main reason is, when you've got a secondary world, okay, I'll, I'll step back. When, you've got, when you're writing in the re real world, if I mention New York, if I mention Paris, if I mention a car, a street, um, if I mention... Um, uh, cell phone. Uh, you all know what I'm talking about, right? In a fantasy world, a secondary world that you built from scratch, you have to convey all those aspects that we would take for granted because they, they are reinvented in that other world. And so, not only are you doing characterization and driving plot um, and, and description and action and setting, um, you are also educating the, the audience, the reader, in the unique aspects of that new world that you created. 
So it is twice as hard as literary contemporary fiction. Yeah, Take it from me, it's just, there, there's no comparison. <laughs> and, and, and what makes it frustrating is then, I, you know, I'm in Canada and there's a thing called Can Lit, which is um, all this sort of stuffy uh, contemporary fiction writers in Canada who look down their noses at genre. Um, and I, you know, I just want to, I don't want to kick their butts. I mean, it's just, it really pisses me off because they haven't a clue. Um, if they want really tough writing, write a fantasy novel. Um, it, it just, you're just reminding me of an anecdote that uh, somebody in news, a journalist talked to Ginger Rogers like 50 years ago and she said, I did everything for the stair date, only backwards and in high heels. <laughs> so is this epic fantasy and fantasy Ginger Rogers <laughs> literature? It is. It's, it's very hard. And, um, and it's strange because a lot of people who comment on it, uh, I, I saw a recent article um, in Oh, was it New York New Yorker, I think it was? It was, a, it was another writer, an American writer, who basically was actually proud of the fact that he had never read any science fiction. You know, okay. if they, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> That's something to be proud of. And so they have expectations. They have a, um, they've built up uh, a, a series of sort of assumptions about the genre mm -hmm. without ever having uh, either explored it as a reader or, and certainly never having tested it as a writer. So, so what do you think uh, the writers, the fans, uh, the whole science fiction and fantasy community should do to eliminate those, uh, the, those literary types looking down on us? Eliminate or, or, or maybe we should do nothing with it and do our stuff and just wait for the things to write well, I, I have a theory on that. Um, I think I think one of the, the, the cornerstones or the foundations of um, somebody having a, what you could call a snotty attitude, um, is the fact that they take themselves too seriously. So if you really want to cut them down, you ridicule them. <laughs> yeah, but who are her? Don't you have this feeling that some fantasy authors are also considering considering themselves too seriously with all this popularity, all these TV series, all these huge sales? That wasn't a pointed question at all. <laughs> <laughs> I see before me this minefield. <laughs> okay, where do I step? No, uh, a little country, a long way from your we state. Are some <laughs> see this on your right, nobody's gonna see this. <laughs> Edit, sure sure there, there is that aspect um but it, it's it's down to it's down to the personalities of, of of the authors themselves and this is what i was saying earlier is that we are no longer uh behind a curtain uh, we are now right out in front and so we have to make our choices very carefully and, and in terms of our commentary as well but I, I i will be fearless enough to say that yes i think that fantasy does take itself a bit too seriously at the moment. And I'm running against that, so. Do you have a question? Uh, I thought you were not. You more, maybe, maybe we could open uh, the floor the for the audience. audience. Maybe for, somebody, a few for a few questions. For a few questions, and we can see where that takes us. Okay, let's go from, we'll go from this part, and then one will ask somebody from this oh, part. Okay. Dashing gentleman, in the second row that we don't know. <laughs> there. Uh, he's walking. Yet he was spotted on Thank you. Uh, so, I was wondering, you described your works as, um, as tragedy with fantastic elements. One could also say that, for instance, uh, Tolkien's uh, Lord of the Rings trilogy is uh, an epic adventure with fantastic elements. And a tragedy as well. And tragedy as well. But uh, how useful do you feel that fantasy as a genre tag is in context? Can you also you know, not write um, like crime fiction with fantastic elements or any other sort of fiction? How useful, of, uh, how useful is it to distinguish between literary works by calling some things fantasy and others not? Uh, well, I mean, it's only useful in terms of um, booksellers and where they're going to put the books uh, in a bookstore. Um, other than that, uh, I mean, I, in Iowa, I was writing a lot of magic realism, um, quote unquote. I mean, I just used that phrase because that's what I was trying. That's what I could get away with, basically. Um, 
and it, it was a lot of sort of tall tales and that kind of stuff. Um, so I don't really, I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't think that much in terms of uh, the, the the usefulness of the, of the title uh, of fantasy or any other name for. Uh, you know, when I, when I think of um, the structural um, inspiration for Gardens of the Moon, for example, it's it's Frank Herbert's Dune. Uh, structurally, that's exactly what I stole. Um, but it's science fiction. So. Thank you. Uh, now somebody from that part? Oh, no, oh, 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 oh. we have her right here. Oh, we have her right here. Yeah. Okay, okay, hi. Um, I was wondering, uh, when you talked earlier about the world building uh, and how difficult it was, uh, is um, the, the amount of effort you put in uh, building a world the reason why there are so few standalone novels, uh, fantasy novels. Um, you, yeah, it, you're probably right. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> at the same, at the same time, I mean, think think of Fritz Leiber and, and uh, Faber and Grey Mouse. Uh, those were novellas and short stories, um, but all set in the same world. Um, Carl Edward Wagner's Kane series. Um, again, a lot of short uh, novellas and, and short stories. Um, so you can, you can actually use uh, shorter works of fiction, but I think a, a general sense is if you've invested as the writer that much time into building that world, you want to stay in it and explore it, mm -hmm. sure. And you're hoping that the reader wants to explore it as well. Yeah, I wanted to say as a reader, you do, you, you do, do want more of it, to see more of it and to explore, and as a writer, I think you feel more uh, comfortable more comfortable? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, 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 oh, okay. Okay. Let's stay on that side for a while. And okay. then we'll talk a bit later, and then we'll ask the other side. Yeah. yeah. You know, well, I was, I was thinking if I could add to what the lady said. Um, do you feel maybe that that it's the publishers today who are. Um, pushing towards more profit by, uh, by uh, pushing uh, trilogies and series and uh, passing by on the, the single novels, maybe in that sense. Uh, I'm not aware of that, no. Um, I know when I sold uh, Gardens of the Moon, I, I, I basically lied. I said it was going to be a trilogy. And, uh, Were they surprised when the fourth book came? Uh, yeah, well, if, if you take silence, as a surprise. Yeah. And when the eighth yeah. book came? Well, no, um, but it was only after, um, I think I was finishing the second one, Dead House Gates, that I, I basically came clean and said, you know, I, I've got ten books planned here. Um, and, uh, and so I think they took, they took quite the risk on, on signing me for basically the entire series. Um, so nowadays, it's hard to see. I think I think the notion of a trilogy is is the one that publishers are comfortable with. I think the notion of a trilogy is something that agents are comfortable with because um, there is always the risk of signing for too many books um, and then realizing you've had a bad deal. And um, agents like three books. Three books will sort of establish you as a beginning writer. Um, and then their next deal, of course, you're going to earn a lot more money. So um, there are there are economic forces uh, at work as well. But standalone novels, if it does really well, I guarantee you that both your agent and, and your editor and your publisher will all be there saying, write, write the sequel. Sure. Thanks. Uh, sorry, just a very practical question. Do you, sh you care to share some information on the graphic novels regarding Kar Saolong that you have planned? Um, or not yet? Well, uh, basically the stage we're at now is, is negotiating out um, the details of the contract. But in terms of um, effectively, uh, I, I'm on board with, with the people I spoke with uh, here. So if we get the graphic novel, um, all signed up and all the rest, then yes, they will be produced here in Serbia. And I'm really happy with that. See?
think we are all happy with that as well. So here's to hoping it all works out. So any more questions on this side? More questions on this side. I don't know why we talk at all. Just let the audience have their questions. We like to talk. We like to we talk. To admit that. A bit too much. Yeah. I'm the organizer. I love to talk. Yes, hello. Uh, who is your favorite sci-fi author and which of his or her books would you recommend the most? Uh, just recently uh, I've been raving about uh, Children of Time, uh, Adrian Tchaikovsky's Arthur C. Clarke <laughs> award-winning one. Um, I'm reading one, one, one right now, and I can't remember the author, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a British author, it's her first novel. Um, what is it? Uh, a Long Way to a uh, Small Angry Planet, along you know, those lines. Really cool title. I wish I could remember it right now. Um, and and Lecky's stuff has been very good. Uh, so uh, when Ian Banks died, I was absolutely crushed. Uh, that was my top my top SF writer uh, in terms of uh, I just adored uh, that writer. So replacing him, I guess uh, 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 Reynolds, Adrian Reynolds. And uh, Peter Hamilton, but those are, those are that's a fair list. Yeah. Have you read Ian McDonald? Uh, Ian McDonald, yes, yes, of course. Ian McDonald, because he he kind of associates you with know, some of the banks, yes. works, especially the new ones. Yes. So, any more questions on this side? You have a question. I don't know if I will let you ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> ask your question. Yeah, you tried to ask mine. Then you should start with it. So, while we are on the topic of science fiction, and while you did mention Frank Herbert's Dune, I would like to ask what do you like most about the Dune series of books? The first one. <laughs> <laughs> what is the first one? Because first book. Uh, the fir uh, first book is Dune. Dune. Yes. Dune. We, uh, the, the way it was published here was weird, so. Yeah. In six, in, in, uh, the, the whole cycle in six books, uh, I think the, the first four were the Dune or the first three. three the first three, right? Yes. The first three were published as one book. As, as, as one book. Dune. Yes, wow. as Dune. So this is wow. why. They were actually separated. They are Dune, both in Dune, uh, Dune, both in the couple of sections in which Mark Deep is actually. Yeah, and the transcripts were also published in that edition of the book. Well, what was it? Children of Dune, uh, Dune Messiah, I think there were three. The Dune? Yeah. Yeah. No, uh, uh, actually, uh, here the original one was the, the three books that were translated here as uh, three books. The original one is one book. And then you have uh, Dune, Dune Messiah, yeah. Children of Dune. Yeah. But here it was translated as Arrakis, Modib, uh, Prophet and then Messiah and everything else. Oh, right. So they started chopping them in little pieces Got in it. order to be published Seriously. more readily. One day we're publishing in a small country. <laughs> <laughs> Any more big Questions science fiction? From question from this, from my side, the favorite side. <laughs> oh, there's my, there's another one. So, um, <laughs> you, you write very memorable characters. Um, Heroes going from the bridge borders and so on up to the larger than life characters like Anomandaris, uh, mm -hmm. Rake, and so on. But uh, uh, there's also very memorable characters which are just appear very briefly, like uh, the guards, the guard with the weak heart in all the hounds, or a circle breaker in Garden mm -hmm. of the Moon. Um, my question would be how do you go about writing? Uh, about them, so do they just appear spontaneously in the flow of the writing of the book? Sometimes, yeah. Um, here's a confession. I don't know how to write a novel. <laughs> um, I learned to write short stories. Uh, and so all of the craft um, that I basically uh, was taught by some very top um, short story writers uh, is all I really knew. And so when I sat down to write um, the novels, I simply wrote, um, well, through 10 novels, the world's longest short story. It's three million words. Uh, and so that is why I'm finding now people are saying the rereadability of the series is very high because with a, with a short story, you have, to, you have to pack a lot into every sentence. It needs to have a multiple purpose. And uh, I wrote my entire novels that way. And that's why it, it can feel like very dense reading because there is nothing accidental going on. There's no sort of 
um, uh, you probably won't get the reference, but there's no five or six pages describing a woman's clothing in her front and her. <laughs> <laughs> Those were the good times when writers were paid by words. <laughs> Uh, okay, now, now uh, we mentioned you. Uh, do you think it's important for writers and readers also, but for writers, to know the history of the genre, to know the capital works of the bygone years, the 20th century, so they can maybe have a dialogue with them, dialogue with the contemporary fantasy, and also for readers to know, um, to have some context in which modern fantasy is. Well, I mean, the dialogue is, is, is definitely a, a useful aspect, but the greatest uh, reward for reading um, earlier works is what you can steal from them. <laughs> because there are things that are, that are going to ins inspire you and send your imagination sort of riffing off of something else that's been um, discussed or, or explored. Um, the science fiction novel I'm writing right now, um, I think I've read uh, every first contact novel ever written in English. And the more uh, I, I sort of specialized in reading those books, the more frustrated I got. And, and that is what led me to the, work, the novel I'm working on now, which is a first contact novel. Oh. That, that, that's very interesting. That's a revelation that nobody else knew, so apart from so, my agent. So, so, so. so uh, actually, we will gave the chance to audience there to pose questions, but now when you started talking about that novel, and what did exactly frustrate you about first contact novels? Was it the nature of aliens, or inability of writers to portray aliens as really aliens? No, no, or? not at all. Um, no, it's the human side that has actually <laughs> bothered me about first contact novels, in the sense that um, if you can imagine an alien species, a, a galactic-faring species, um, coming to uh, make contact with Earth. So many novels, in fact, virtually all novels, they either proceed on the basis of the first contact being with scientists, um, usually hardcore scientists, so the physics, physicists, uh, astronomers, uh, or astronauts, so quasi-military, uh, or politicians. Um, and it occurs to me that, that none of those um, aspects would actually be of any interest to an alien species because our political structure um, is, is not relevant. It's, um, it, it is so fractious and so broken up uh, uh, and the authority, um, the authority systems that exist are so colloquial um, for uh, anyone but us. Um, and in terms of uh, the scientists, it'd be like the equivalent of PhD in, um, in astronomy uh, trying to have a conversation with a four-year-old, you know, that, you know who's, who's, who's moving blocks um, uh, in a playground. Um, so, you know, our level of science, whatever it happens to be, is going to be um, child's play for that species. So, that always bothered me. And the other thing was, um, so often, uh, I was reading quite a few of uh, one particular author who's doing, doing a fair bit of first contact of exploration in his fiction, I won't mention the name, but um, <laughs> invariably the president of the United States is, is a major character, or is a character, and invariably they say something along the lines of, uh, well, I wish this, this would all go away. I wish this was not happening on my watch. And it always struck me as just the most um, parochial style of thinking whatsoever. Um, and so I wanted to write against that, and, and in order to do so, I had to think of a new value system. Uh, 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 what would the alien value system be? And um, it occurred to me that in a post-scarcity galaxy, um, the only thing of value would be art. And so that's the angle I'm taking. So there you go, people, exclusive. <laughs> Here, obviously. So uh, now we go to questions from this side. And the question from the bunny in the first row. So my question is, do you more like uh, the world building or character building? 
Sorry? Uh, do you more like building a character or building a world for that character? So. Um, oh, character. Which would you prefer? Always, like? always character. Okay, uh, this is going to be a little bit long-winded, so I apologize in advance. Uh, last night you said that uh, you almost never see papers on new authors like Abercrombie and such. I'm but sorry? You never see papers yes. on Abercrombie and similar new age writers, but then you sort of evaded to, say, yeah, to say your piece on what do you think about them. So I wanted to be direct. <laughs> And in order to make it interesting, I propose we play a game. <laughs> the usual one is fuck, marry, kill. But since this is fantasy, we can make it knight, crown, and behead. So I'm going to give you three authors. You have to choose which one's knighted, which one will be crowned, and which one will be beheaded. So let's say Mark Lawrence, Joe Abercrombie, and Pat Rothfuss. Well, that's not really an appropriate question. I mean, you cannot expect Mr. Erickson to badmouth somebody. No, 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 no. Not only that, I'm reading, I read science fiction right now. Um, and when I'm writing fantasy, I don't read fantasy. And so I'm not, I'm not up to date. Uh, the latest book I've read is um, The Traitor Barrow Cormorant. And um, it was recommended to me, and it was a fantastic it's read. It's great. Um, but that's, that's the only fantasy that's I've read in about five or six years. Very nice thing. And we won't play this game with science fiction authors, so... <laughs> so no, we won't, be had, we won't be beheading science fiction authors. We love science great. fiction authors. And yes, Greater Barry Cormoran is a great book, and the second one should be coming out soon, I hope so. So that's a recommendation from Mr. Erickson and for the Lord of The gentleman in the second row as well, I think. Hello. Uh, first of all, it's an honor to to do this in your life, and I wanted to say how great impact you had on me as a game uh, game master. Uh, and uh, the question is, uh, how did you develop the system of magic? It was uh, really a huge impact for me when I uh, read first time uh, Gardens of the Moon. And when I finished the book, I was like, wait, I have to go back. <laughs> I have to read it uh, once again because. It was confusing for me. First time I have uh, experience to read uh, uh, such, uh, how to say, uh, it was really philosophy and uh, have, uh, it, it, it's not uh, appropriate to say for fantasy, it's, uh, you, you can imagine, of course, but uh, System of Magic, uh, especially in the third book with, where you write that it is a part of one living organism and it's part of an ancient god, how did you develop that? Uh, um, we sort of just, we created a magic system that was an adaptation of what the GURPS system was, was doing. Um, but we wanted, I mean, both myself and Ian Esteban Cam um, are anthropologists, and so we wanted something that, that felt organic. And one of the things um, I, when I was, I was in Luca at, at the Comics and Games just uh, last week, and um, I was on a panel with uh, Brandon Sanderson, who of course does uh, very, very elaborate magic systems and, and works out all the, the mechanics and the details. And, and in our discussions, we, it was very clear that we, we sort of view magic as uh, almost the opposite in terms of what we want to do with it. Um, so for me, I prefer a magic system that um, is actually full of mystery, and so I don't explain a lot. Um, because I think of, of magic and the role of magic in fantasy uh, is to evoke a sense of wonder. And if you over explain it, it simply becomes an alternate science. And I was not interested in that. Okay, and just a short one, sorry. Uh, uh, tomorrow I'm on the business trip and uh, I won't be able to come for signing a book and I brought the book. Could you sign me at the end? <laughs> of course, please. Okay, thank you. I to ćemo ograničiti, nažalost. I to ograničiti, ali dobro. Kad završi trivina, onda ćemo vidjeti sa popisivanjem. Tako da, ako imate pitanje o popisivanju, to na kraju trivine. Okay.
first, uh, it's a quite a pleasure to meet you and <laughs> see you a couple of meters from me. Uh, so, uh, in modern authors, contemporary uh, authors of fantasy uh, sometimes very boldly claim that uh, they have introduced reality into the fantasy. Uh, but would you agree with me, in my personal opinion, that uh, reality and that uh, topics from the world, as you said, conversation with reality has always been there. For example, if we start with Tolkien, PTSD, trappings of power, even some images of feminism, do you think uh, that sometimes uh, we hear these authors boldly claim something that has always been there? Yeah, it happens. Um, but it's hard to know how much of that hyperbole is all about selling their book, as opposed to any anything else. Um, I know I, 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 people complain um, that I don't have much of a, a presence online, which is true. Um, but a lot of uh, a lot of writers, especially. Uh, ones uh, in the genre younger than me, so for example, uh, I guess Abercrombie and uh, Rothfuss and all the rest, they've got a very strong online presence. Um, and and so quite often, um, occasionally, you know, on my Facebook feed or whatever, uh, some article will pop in and it'll talk about um, how, I don't know, how Rothfuss has, has changed fantasy or how uh, Abercrombie has changed fantasy. And so, I look at that and I think, well, actually, um, no, I got there first in some of those things, <laughs> um, but nobody's really noticed, uh, or, or if not me, then Glenn Cook uh, preceded me as, as one of the, um, the most, I think, influential um, epic fantasy writers um, for bringing everything down to earth and making it feel very real. But, you see, and, and those claims are not... It's not Joe's fault, and it's not uh, Patrick's fault. Um, it is uh, quite often, going back to the notion of readers who are not aware of what's been going on in fantasy over the last decade, uh, who think, having discovered this stuff in this first book, that that's the first time it's ever shown up. And of course, that's not the case. Uh, just to build on what you said, do you think that there's this general notion, idea, among those who haven't read much older fantasy, that when you say epic fantasy, it's like unicorns and rainbows, and, any, and when you read something about like Abercrombie or Office, you go, okay, this is real, and the epic fantasy is like elves and singing, and because people usually just think to Tolkien, mm -hmm. even though Tolkien does have a strong dialogue in reality, like PTSD and the war, and uh, people usually have this idea of it being both uh, flowers, and, and tell me if I'm not speaking into the mic. So the answer is yes. <laughs> yes. yes. Absolutely. Oh, no. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay, so I've been, I've been reading fantasy since I was like 10 years old. And recently my dad uh, keeps telling me that I should somehow move on and uh, read more quality stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, he read Tolkien and uh, he thinks that everything is the same. And uh, I can't really explain to him that it's so different. So what would you say to a person like that? How would you plug a fantasy to a person who... Uh, has he read Tolkien? Yes, and he loves okay. it. So buy him uh, Stephen R. Donaldson's Lord Fowl's Bane <laughs> as the answer and the response to Tolkien. Uh, uh, can you, what do you think, uh, is it important for fantasy fans and readers to read other things than just strictly fantasy? Uh, to just know the, the whole, the, all the things that world can offer them in, in literature? Because there, there is a lot of wonderful things in, in science fiction, because a lot of people are just compartmentalizing, they're reading just fantasy, or just epic fantasy, or just uh, young adults. How, how is it important to you? I have found that um, readers of fantasy and science fiction are, in general, and I'm generalizing here, uh, from my experience, uh, are far more broadly read than readers of contemporary fiction. Far more. Uh, and I find it even more noticeable if I'm among writers of those. So science fiction, fellow science fiction writers and fantasy writers, we can talk all kinds of literature, uh, from Victorian literature to travel literature, um, 
to, well, you name it, we can talk about it because they've read it all. Um, I remember sitting in, in um, with a group of, uh, I guess, contemporary fiction writers in Canada and trying to sort of mention some of these other writers and, and these other genres, and they didn't have a clue. They hadn't read any of them. So I think, I think um, this is a very sophisticated and, and widely read audience, uh, probably more so than almost any other. <laughs> okay, people are clapping to themselves, but it's fine. So, that was a compliment. That was a compliment. Uh, I just have one small question. Uh, how much does a fan fiction and here I am. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, how much does fan fiction and uh, I don't know, assuming of the fans and guessing about the story plot and something else affects writers nowadays and how much did it affect them before and how much does it affect you and other writers? Because you said you sure have a strong it, online presence. Yeah, I'm not sure how it affects other writers. Um, I know I was getting some, I think I mentioned this yesterday, I was getting some responses uh, after my first three books, basically uh, a criticism that um, I couldn't stay with a single character any length of time. And I, I remember getting pissed off at that, so that's what altered the fourth book and the entire first section of that fourth book is a single point of view. So uh, occasionally you, it, it can get under your skin and it can, it can change uh, what you're planning. But um, uh, I, I think that turned out to be a positive thing for that book. It's very funny that in response to the criticisms, uh, you created the most divisive <laughs> character. You, yeah, you but it stayed with them. The, the, stayed with the books. Them. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Hello? Um, here. Yes, please raise your hand so. I'm here. All right. <laughs> Uh, I would like to ask a question about uh, uh, politics. Uh, uh, one of the authors I like very much is Ursula Le Guin. And uh, I must admit I miss, somehow miss uh, uh, the political and social consciousness that was during the 60s. Uh, do you feel that uh, magic uh, and uh, fantasy is uh, uh, more centered uh, on the individual? It somehow seems that uh, uh, no social context existed, no political development, that society uh, is not uh, the actor, actor on its own, but it is somehow the, the combination of unrelated individuals who have some abilities to do something to change society. Have you and read my books? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes, you no. Know. No. <laughs> oh, right, right. So, I mean, I mean uh, general uh, uh, fantasy uh, scene. Well, I can only speak for myself in terms of what interested me. And, and, and as a writer, for me, it was always cultures in contact with each other. Um, so that, that whole aspect of um, dominant culture versus uh, a uh, recessive or submissive culture or a weaker culture um, is what drives all of history and drives the human condition. And so. Uh, that, that has always been uh, a huge element of what I'm writing. Uh, as for other people, um, I think a lot, of, a lot of writers are maybe, be, maybe actively avoiding uh, the political side of things. Science fiction is a bit more upfront in its uh, political meanings. Um, fantasy tends to, well, it tends to default back to uh, class system and um, an aristocracy, and uh, that's a pretty stiltified system. So. Hi. Uh, could you please tell us if, uh, um, could you please give us a hint on when the Carso Long Trilogy, <laughs> or the first book at least, and if the events will take place after the Cripple God, like a timeline? Sure. Um, let's see, what have I got to do? I've got um, the third Willful Child novel, which is a Star Trek spoof. Um, which I'll be writing in the spring. So, first of all, I'm finishing the first Contact novel, I hope, by the end of um, February. Um, and then I'm off to a conference in, in March, and then in spring I'll write the, the third Willful Child novel, uh, The Search for Spark. And, um, <laughs> and then, once that one's done, uh, I'll start on the third 
uh, Carcanus uh, to complete that trilogy, uh, Walk in Shadow. And then once that's done, I do have to intersperse three novellas, vocal and called approach novellas, somewhere in there. Um, and then I'll turn to the Carson trilogy. And I'm thinking right now that the Carson trilogy will pick up between 15 and 30 years after the Crippled God. Okay, okay. thanks. And hopefully you won't write it in 15 or 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> You seem to have a very so. packed schedule, I, I do, have to say. I do, I do. Hello. I'm going to be kind of cliche and short. Uh, what was your biggest inspiration for... Uh, louder, please. Uh, what was your biggest inspiration for writing sci-fi? For writing? What, what, what got you in it? What got me into writing? Yeah, what, you, what got you into writing? Um, actually, I thought I was going to be a comic book illustrator. I was an illustrator before I was doing anything else. Um, but this was back in a time when you didn't have um, Wacom tablets and um, you basically, to do uh, a single frame uh, by yourself uh, and do all the coloring and all the rest, all the inking and everything, um, for me as, as an 18 or 19 year old in Winnipeg, it was uh, an onerous task. But what I was finding was my illustrating had uh, an implicit narrative in it and um, eventually I dropped the illustrating and just stayed with the narrative. Um, but I think uh, Donaldson's uh, uh, first three books, uh, let's see, the first one came out in 77, I think it is. That was very formative for me, but prior to that I had read all the Howard stuff and, and Burroughs and, and um, Asimov and, and all kinds of things. So, um, but I never really believed um, that I was ever going to be a writer. Um, and so in university, the first few years, um, a friend and I uh, ended up hijacking the, uh, the faculty at the university's uh, its newsletter. And um, we just started writing. Uh, and we actually locked the office door and didn't let anybody talk to us. <laughs> it was good fun. Um, and uh, I think through the mailbox at the university, uh, this letter dropped about a short story contest, a local one. And I thought, oh, the hell of it. Um, so I wrote a short story that I think came in second place. It was great when I met the judges. They were all sort of these little white-haired old women who were about 90 years old. <laughs> so charmed at the story I wrote. Um, so that made me start thinking that maybe I, I, I could, I could do, do some writing. And then I was very lucky um, in my master's, first master's year uh, in archaeology at the University of Manitoba uh, to have some spare time for uh, a creative writing course. Uh, it turned out the course was a Wednesday night and it was poetry. And, um, but the guy, the guy teaching it, uh, he said, look, if you're going to write a novel, go ahead and write it. You don't have to come to class, um, and, but at the end of the year, just bring me what you've got. I don't think he anticipated that at the end of the year he'd get a 700-page novel. <laughs> but he did. And uh, it, it was extraordinary. He, he spent the summer uh, just kicking around his house uh, editing it. And uh, that sort of level of commit commitment was just... Uh, phenomenal. Um, and that really fired me up. And um, I remember we were sitting right at, right at the beginning of the next year, so I was about to head off to uh, the University of Victoria, leaving archaeology. And he looked across at me, we were drinking beers at his place, and he just said, you know, I can see you as a science fiction author. And I thought, yeah, right, whatever. So um, it turns out he was right. And uh, so there, there it started. But um, it was very much Donaldson and, and Basically, Lord Fowl's Bane for me uh, was the novel that dragged epic fantasy into adulthood. Um, because Tolkien, yes, as an adult you can read it, but at the same time you could still read it when you were 10 years old, and 9 years old, or whatever. Uh, Donaldson stuff I would not get handed over to a 10 year old. <laughs> yeah. But I see there's this reoccurring motif in your work. Uh, somebody asks you for a sample, you give them 750 pages, and then the uh, publisher asks for a trilogy, and they get 10 books. So, I see this is something that keeps, ha keeps happening. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go on. Do you like the covers of your books? How do you? Well, there's lots of different covers. Um, 
one of the one of the uh, one of the covers, uh, the series of covers I liked the best were the ones that were all stolen from Glenn Cook's covers. <laughs> <laughs> they were really cool. No, I like uh, Steve Stone's stuff uh, coming out of uh, Trans World in, in the UK, which then was picked up by the US and uh, I, and it's picked up here by the Google. Mm -hmm. so. You, you never wanted to do your own illustrations. Yeah, you were an illustrator. Because, because of your origin story, you heard. Uh, I could have, I suppose, but uh, no publisher would allow it. <laughs> Just some input or something, no? I'm not a gaming. Uh, <laughs> so, are there any other questions? I think I saw a show. Okay. Well, thank you. So we brought up many interesting issues and uh, it's a food for thought. So I have many questions, but uh, this one will be about postmodernism because you frequently evoke postmodernism when you speak about your work. So I was wondering, I mean, we, here at least we see that there is a certain, uh, let's say, problem with postmodern theories or postmodernism as an orientation within academia we can say almost a backlash against postmodernism. So what would you say, uh, what is the um, attitude of uh, contemporary epic fan uh, fantasy uh, as a genre towards postmodernism today? A blank look. Uh, I, it's, um, I have, I, there's one scholar that I argue with over my own works because I call him postmodern and he calls him poststructural. Um, Generally, though, I don't think there's, and it, it actually ties into um, that element of fantasy, epic fantasy, taking itself too seriously. Uh, I don't think you can effectively apply a postmodern approach to uh, writing uh, an epic fantasy novel if you do take yourself too seriously. Um, because what the postmodern approach is doing is, is um, turning around and facing the structural uh, tropes of whatever genre you're in, and commenting on them, and at times subverting them. Uh, so you need a sense of humor in order to do that, because you have to set up the pratfalls. Um, if you if you recall in Gardens of the Moon, um, the character Crocus believes he's 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 the one to save Chalice uh, towards the end of the novel, and um, he fails utterly, and so she goes off with somebody else. And, and so that kind spoilers. of thing is, <laughs> spoilers. Well, I, I suppose that it is. A good thing. Um, anyways, it comes back in the eighth book. So, yeah. But um, so yeah, uh, in that sense, I'm setting things up. But also, I've, I've described the eighth book, Toll the Hounds, as the cipher to the entire um, series, primarily because the the point of view um, is a kind of omniscient. Uh, Krupp, the one character named Krupp. Um, and once you sort of recognize that as the cipher, then it becomes very evident, or it should, one hopes, uh, that the entire series is uh, a metafictional approach to fantasy. But I don't see that going on very, in very uh, many other works. But mind you, like I said, I've not read any modern um, epic fantasy. Thank you. Yep. One more short question, sure. because you mentioned the first contact as uh, uh, the topic of your new novel, and uh, as we see, uh, you probably follow this uh, media frenzy about so-called Tabby Star, the new uh, the star that uh, supposedly has some sort of uh, alien structure around yeah. it. Yeah. So, do you think that maybe that in this context of the real world of uh, people or society or civilization getting ready to imagine the, the contact with some uh, big otherness, let's say, that way. Do you think that uh, uh, epic fantasy maybe offers some um, uh, interesting paths or approaches? Is epic fantasy maybe the like kind of uh, fut uh, futuristic uh, anthropology of today? Probably not. Um, and I think not because Epic fantasy, regardless of the species that you, you know, the sentient species that you're writing about, are all reflections of the human condition. And a, an alien species is going to be utterly different from that. And so if anything, it would set up the wrong uh, expectations uh, among humans uh, regarding that species. Thank you.
Hi. Uh, first of all, uh, it's a great honor addressing you. And uh, as for my question, uh, speaking of uh, writing a short story, uh, what uh, would you say is essential to it? Uh, is it uh, plot driven or uh, do you first uh, form characters? I don't know, you, you said um, you prefer um, character building than world building, but um, what advice would you give uh, on writing short stories besides role playing? I mean. Uh, role playing is very good, um, primarily because if you're role playing with other players, uh, you have no control over your characters. So all you've got is the narrative, and so they can take you anywhere, which um, teaches you as a writer some level of humility regarding those characters and humbleness, which I think is a good thing. Um, I do have a, a series of essays on, on writing process of writing. Um, and you can find them at a site called lifeasahuman.com, all one word. Uh, Stephen Erickson, I think it's under archives. Um, mostly the advice I give regarding any kind of writing and any kind of fiction is to finish what you start because that that is the hardest part. Um, quite often in, in great enthusiasm you create a, a story or, or a series or a setting writing with the character and um, it's all looking really good and it's exciting etc and then it starts slowing down the actual writing process it starts turning into a grind and what's happening of course is with each sentence you write you're narrowing your options in terms of that story now the reason why I say at that point many authors beginning authors will feel as if the, their enthusiasm is palled and has left them and they will then start the next project and they'll get all excited about the beginning of it and they'll write their way 10, 15 pages in and then it starts slowing down and turning into a grind again. Well, those slowing down points in that writing process are the only places you're going to learn as a writer because everything you've written up to that point, you know how to do. But pushing through that moment is what you want to do as a writer. And once you've done that, that, that is where all, it's like, it's like doing weights, right? Um, if, you're, if you're in a weights room or whatever, and you're in shape, and, and you know, so you can do your 20 reps, uh, but the next five are the ones that kill you, right? Well, it's the same thing in writing. You've got to get to those next five. Okay. Thank you. So I think we can take a couple more questions. One, uh, two, maybe. Okay, we have one there. So, hello, uh, I have a question. Uh, it's, it is, we are here talking about fantasy tropes, and uh, one of the main tropes I see in all fantasy is predetermination or predestination. So, uh, and uh, you mentioned earlier that Green Dark brings despair. And I don't think that there's nothing that brings more despair than predestination. Mm -hmm. Do you think that fantasy will also move away from that trope, or will it remain prevalent because of its sources? Um, well, I hope so. Um, somebody uh, pitched to us a few years back uh, to do a, um, uh, I guess, an action um, electronic game version of the Laz and stuff. And um, we had two or three Skype meetings and then eventually just told them no. Um, primarily because, well, two reasons. One, they wanted 60% action and 40% story, or even 30% story and 70% action. We wanted it the other way around. Um, but then they also said that even though it was going to be set in the Malazan world, the main character was going to be um, uh, a young boy who's actually sired by a god. And, and, and was actually a resurrected uh, god. And um, we just sort of stared at these people and said, you know, have, have you even read these books? There's no, there's no resurrection, there's none of that stuff going on. Um, so I think quite often those tropes uh, really are the first tropes one comes to when they can't think of anything else, um, especially in um, fantasy uh, electronic games and those storylines. It's always the birthright, all those kinds of things. Um, and uh, so I suspect 
that will start losing its, its, uh, its attractions um, to you as players especially. And once, once you've lost interest in that kind of thing, that predestinated, pre predestination or predetermination, um, the, the actual writers of, and creators of these games um, and novels uh, will catch on and hopefully come up with something new. Yeah. Well, well, we could talk about limitations of video games and video game narratives. It's we could take, we could, there's a backlash against, but that's a totally different panel. We, but another one thing, I'm going to reserve uh, the mic and ask you one question because you mentioned the first contact, the contact with alien races, and that you have sorry, that you have races in epic fantasy that are not human, that they are still a reflection of us. Do you think that's something that needs to be changed? Because I know yesterday you mentioned that you never had a viewpoint of one of your characters because he's thousands of years old and you simply cannot imagine how such a character thinks. So you do think we need to make our elves or orcs or whatever more alien because they are a different race? Yes, absolutely, yeah. Much more alien and not simply serving the purpose of fodder for your hero's swords. Absolutely. Okay. Because that's an interesting uh, thing for me, so I just noticed it. Any other question? Okay, one more. And then I think we really need to finish, finish up. Uh, I also wanted to ask you a question about the um, illustrations of your book covers. So since you were working on illustration, uh, how, how involved are you with the choosing of the artist that will do the artwork for your books? And do you think that it is an important uh, visual representation of your written work? Yeah, I'm not involved at all. Um, I'm basically, most authors are, are said, you know, they're asked at some point, um, what, what would you like to sort of see on the cover? And so then you give a very vague response and, and off it goes. Um, there's always been, I think, a, a, a professional or publishing uh, rule regarding uh, giving the authors too much uh, freedom when it comes to covers and things. And so it's, up, it's out of our hands. It's down to marketing. It's down to uh, uh, publishing decisions and boardroom decisions. And whether the artist can produce on the time um, is a big one. That said, the subterranean press editions uh, have been pretty spectacular. Mm. Very, very expensive. Very <laughs> yeah, 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 I know. Thank he you. sadly added. <laughs> so I think that's about it. So uh, uh, that uh, that's our volunteer. That's not another question. So I think we can uh, thank Mr. Erickson for thank being you. here. sign his books tomorrow from 3 p.m. So please come, bring two books per person. We are limiting for now. At maximum. At maximum. You don't have to bring two. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for coming. And maybe, maybe you will just sign uh, three or four books. Three or four books, uh, please. Okay. Uh, only if you cannot possibly come tomorrow or read the books to somebody. Thank you.